in this episode, we reviewed Autumn Sonata, which was directed and written by Igmar Bergman, and this starred Ingrid Bergman and Liv Ullman. Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, and theater, as well as other areas of the arts. I want to welcome back to the show Raquel Raquel Stetcher, who is a classic movie enthusiast and and a lover of all things film. She started the classic film blog Out of the Past in 2007, where she reviews movies and books. She reports from the TCM Classic Film Festival and interviews authors and historians. Raquel hosts an annual summer reading challenge where she encourages people to read six classic film books and review them online for a chance to win a prize. In 2018, she branched out with uh, Quell Movies, a website devoted to indie, foreign, documentary, and LGBTQ film. She's attended festivals like SXSW and the Toronto International Film Festival as a member of the press and is a certified Rotten Tomatoes critic. When she's not writing on her blog, she's a freelance writer and contributes articles on classic film to Turner Classic Movies, DVD Netflix, The Film Detective, among many others. Raquel, welcome back. Thanks for joining me again. Thank you. It's ex- I'm excited to be back to talk about movies. No, me too. It's always a pleasure. I hope I pronounced that right. Your other website is it? Is it QL or uh, did I get that Kel. right? Kel. Okay. It's like a play on my first name, Raquel Kel. Ah, <laughs> okay. I was wondering about that. Okay, I wanted to make sure I got that down. Um, so it's you know we we've talked about a, a number of uh, of different films, you know, pre code film noir, and I know that you you like a lot of foreign films. I know you like Truffaut a lot, and and different uh, French filmmakers and such. Um, This is the first time I've talked about Bergman, Igmar Bergman film with you. So uh, I was curious, uh, have you seen a lot of his films in the past or what's, what's been your experience just generally with his movies? Um, I have kind of limited experience with Ingmar Bergman's films, although I have to say wild strawberries and the seventh seal are like two of my absolute favorite movies. Oh, I I didn't know that. I really enjoy movies that explore the end of life, you know, and what it like looking back on life and um, living to the fullest in your last moments. Like I really like Akira Kurosaro's Ikiru, oh, which yeah. was remade yeah. recently as Living. And those two are absolutely amazing movies. So those two really speak to me. And also, um, you know, I, I got to see Max von Sydow in person. That was really exciting. He was like a Longtime oh, wow. collaborator with Ingmar Bergman, but yeah. the Seventh Seal is just like visually stunning. Yeah, the metaphors, the story, and that le- the final scene is just like breathtaking and oh, yeah. a little unnerving. So yeah, his films are interesting. And in in um preparing for this, I was going through his filmography and making a list of all these really interesting early films that I think um, I would love to explore. I like the themes that he um, dives into in his films. Yeah, me too. I mean, he's, you know, he just, he has this deep understanding of the inner life of people and, and their relationships. And this is a film, Autumn Sonata, Autumn Sonata that I've seen once before. This is this, and I really liked it. And um, this is my second viewing and equally loved it even though there there were so, some things that i i i, I there, it does have a share of flaws i feel which which uh we'll get into i'll curious if you you would agree or not uh but just generally speaking was this your first viewing H- had you seen this before this was my first viewing okay. i've been meaning to watch this especially since i love ingrid ingrid bergman the other right. bergman here <laughs> um and this being her swan song i was very mm. curious about it so this was my first viewing okay. and um i enjoyed it but also it's a it's a bit intense you it's know so intense no, yeah yeah i mean this is this is coming from a very dark place from ingmar bergman's life and it's all very emotional and um, it's it's basically all these characters in some sort of crisis, like mostly mother and daughter in a in a crisis with their relationship, 
and um, there's no light moments. It's just serious throughout. So yeah. it's, it's exhausting to watch, but yeah. I think it's also very indicative of Bergman. And someone said it was Bergman making a Bergman movie. So if you want to get to know his work, this is a great um, one to dive into, I think. Yeah, you have to. I mean, for me, every time I start a Bergman film, <laughs> I just have to take a few breaths because I just know it's going to be oh, I'm like, OK, this is going to be like like a fight. It's like getting into a yeah. fight. Like, it's so I mean, he so, deals so with intense. all these serious subjects, you know, definitely. Like religion and suicide yeah. and um, self-loathing, the end of relationships. Yeah. I mean, everything is just high stakes emotionally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, you said something which is interesting, which I think which I think is true. I mean, he did have in his early career, he did have some lighter films and, you know, he did have some comedic moments, uh, but certainly by the time, you know, I'm not an expert on his, on his work, but certainly by the sixties and seventies, his films were just really dark and, and really dramatic. And there, there's only, um, the only moment I found myself chuckling a little bit in this film was when uh, uh, Liv Oldman, who's in Ingrid Bergman's daughter, is playing the piano. And, <laughs> and oh. then Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman was like, I was very moved. And then she's like, it was, you know, the way you played it. And then she's like, what do you mean by that? And, you know, so this, you know, this mother daughter conflict they have. And she's like, well, you didn't like my interpretation. And and Ingrid Bergman's like, no, no, no. I thought it was great. I thought it was really. And then she's like, well, you show me how you would do it. She's like, well, if you insist, just the way it could, like she knew she could play it better. Just that, <laughs> that, uh, that rivalry. And, and of course the other moment right before the dinner where Liv Ullman saying to her husband, oh, watch her come down in a black dress because she has to show that she's mourning her the, the loss of her boyfriend who off the top, you know, we find out her boy, long boyfriend has died. And then they cut to Ingrid Bergman, who's like, when she's alone, she's often talking to herself. And she's like, well, I'm not going to wear the black dress because that's what they're going to expect me to wear. I'm going to come down in this red dress. Uh, and she, so that was really the only lighter moments for me i don't know if that was something that struck you as funny or you know <laughs> or or just somewhat light i think some of the antics of the mother character charlotte are just kind of um absurd to in to an extent where it it, it does become funny yeah like in the in the very beginning moments when um charlotte arrives at eva's house and um, they're pulling out like her her luggage and everything. She's having her daughter do all the work. Um, and then oh, yeah, she yeah. goes right. I mean, they they haven't seen each other in a long time. She goes right into herself. Like she's exactly. talking about yeah. what's been going on with her, how Leonardo died. And then that whole flashback sequence is kind of absurd as well because she's narrating it and you just get this one room. But then you hear her say that, Leonardo asked her to leave the room so he could die without her there. Yeah. And that's like, wow. Yeah. Wow. People really, I mean, even your lover of 13 years doesn't even want you around. I mean, there's something going on. This woman is very introspective. She's very self, well, not introspective. She's, she's focused on herself. She's very yeah. selfish. Absolutely. And the level yeah. of selfishness, it goes to a, to a level of absurdity because it's just so extreme. Well, you know, that that's a good point. And which which was something about this film, which is interesting, is that the they uh, Charlotte has her point of view and then Eva has her point of view about their relationships and things that have happened in the past. And then sometimes when I really think about it, I mean, it's like anything else in life. There's two sides. You know, there's always two sides to a story. And, you know, if as the audience, if you're listening to, you know, Eva has this long mon monologue uh, in the second half of the film where she's just tearing into her mother. And, you know, you could just take her word for it because Ingrid Bergman only defends herself slightly. But when you really think about it, sometimes I'm like, is she being really fair to the to 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 her mother? Like, you know, I I, I could totally understand her her feelings and you know her mother worked so much and was distant and and um you know she talks about how she 
she made her wear braces and she cut her hair and she looked like a boy and everyone thought she was ugly at school. Um, and that when her mother was playing piano, she would send her out of the room because she just wanted to be alone. Um, so it just seems like everything that Eva was saying that went wrong in her life. She was totally blaming her mother for like, she says she doesn't know how to love, but then you look at the way she is with her sister who's become so ill and she was so loving with the sister and she could even understand everything her sister was saying, even though it didn't seem as if anyone could understand her. I don't know exactly what happened to her. Um, but it just made me wonder like this, this element of like how reliable uh, uh, are these are, are these various characters and their points of views? And I thought I thought it was really well done in the sense that Bergman is I think he's uh, he's keeping it open ended enough so that you you uh, depending on the audience are questioning uh, some of these various point of views about all these things they're saying in the past. I, I, I was just curious, like was that your experience? Were you kind of like mm, I don't know. Eva, you know, it's like you seem to be blaming your mother for everything. I don't know if that was what you thought. On first viewing, I was team daughter, you know, because I thought, oh, my goodness, anyone yeah. who's ever gone through um, growing up with an inattentive um, parent or an emotionally distant parent will kind of relate to what she's going through. And that scene at night, you know, when they're having that confrontation, I mean, Liv Ullman is really putting it out there. She's oh, yeah. screaming and yeah. crying. I mean, it's intense. Yeah. And then I watched a couple interviews with the two actresses with Ingrid Bergman and Liv Ullman. And Liv Ullman said that she did not understand her character. She did not understand why her character was blaming her mother so much and that she thought yes. that she was going to an extreme. And then Ingrid Bergman said that she, um, when she read the script, she thought that the character needed um, uh, maybe a little more nuance and to have some lighter moments. And she even suggested a joke or two because this was just so extreme. Right. Um, and my thought is that these are two unreliable characters in terms of they are defending themselves. They have a wall up and they're trying to push against the other person in their own way. Um, and also I think because of Ingmar Bergman's like where he was in life, he was in a tax exile. He had fled from Sweden because of, because of tax evasion, he got in trouble for it and he went into a deep depression. So he said, now's the time to do a story about a mother daughter relationship. And he himself had emotionally distant parents and had yeah. terrible oh, upbringing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that he wants you to believe that the daughter is suffering. And this is like his kind of emotional so, outpouring. Yeah. Yeah. But we kind of know this is a little too emotional. There's, there's, we're we're getting the two extremes of the story, but there's got to be a middle ground where you where you look at it maybe a little more rationally. I um, agree. So that was my impression of it. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I I totally agree, and I had the same experience because, you know, it's like anything else. Like when people talk in life with such conviction, and if it's someone that you love or trust or know well, you'll often believe that person. And then you won't really think, well, is there another side to this? Like you want, you know? and uh, sometimes you do have to step back a little bit. And it's 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 acted so beautifully. Like I, when Liv Ullman is tearing into her, like I just had tears coming down my face. I mean, it was like just it's it amazing. was so um, powerful. And Ingrid Bergman defends herself a little bit, but then ultimately apologizes for being you know, so selfish and childish as she puts it. And I'm sure, you know, uh, cause Liv Oldman talked about it was that she, Ingrid Bergman had said, <laughs> Ingrid Bergman had said, I'm not going to apologize. If my daughter talked to me that, that way, I'd smack her in the face. And, uh, you know, they had it out, they had a big fight. And then Bergman said, no, you're going to have to say these lines. And Liv Oldman po points out that if you look at the way Ingrid Bergman is apologizing, she looks rather, um angry and i i didn't necessarily think she looked angry i thought she looked sort of 
hostile and um almost dead i took it as dead like her daughter had almost destroyed her in that moment she's still very uh, uh she's very emotional um and but he gave them the freedom to do whatever they wanted with the roles as long as they didn't change the the lines um I, did you think that she looked mad in that moment when she was apologizing. I don't know what you thought about that. So this is one thing I love about Ingrid Bergman is her face. Oh her yeah. Her face is, was so fascinating. Like Incredible. I'll watch Casablanca and just want to see the light frame, her face and her, how she expresses through just like her eyes and her just kind of serenity. She was it's so really good. interesting. Oh my God. There were several yeah. moments where, I mean, obviously Ingmar Bergman with the, with the, close-ups of the oh, face and how the face is God. framed yeah that famous shot of Liv Allman looking right at Ingrid Bergman when they're at the piano oh so good and you have it kind of like they're they're um perpendicular to each other it's just like a piece of like a work of art just just yeah. in that uh, mode yeah but Ingrid Bergman does a lot with her face in this movie there is a point where um um her the daughter character is talking about the death of her son and um, and she starts to kind of ramble on about things that have been going on. And Ingrid Bergman turns her face away and looks off into the distance. And this is right before um, they do the little slideshow with the photos of the dead right. boy. And um, and she goes upstairs and her husband is talking to um, her mom about like, oh my goodness, my daughter's so neurotic. She's rambling. And you can tell at that moment when she had turned her face away and looked off into the distance that she was just ready to disconnect. She's like, this is, this is your problem. So yeah. I, there's several moments like that throughout the film where in her, in her face, you see that she's almost building up a shield because she's being attacked emotionally. Like look at yeah. all the bad things you've done and yeah. look how you destroyed me. But this woman is incredibly selfish. So she has to shut that off. Yes. To defend yes. herself um, until she literally breaks away from everything. So um, I'm not even sure what my point was for that. But I just think Ingrid Bergman says a lot with her face. So on the second viewing of this movie, I looked for that. I looked for those moments where the camera goes up to her face or you see her in um you see just like her her um her from the side and she does a lot. It's very subtle but very powerful. Yeah, I totally agree. And that that scene was really it was really interesting how she took to her daughter mourning the child because you know Liv Oldman's character has not changed the room of the child at all and then Ingrid Bergman was like why, why you know why have you not changed this room she was almost um she almost was disturbed by that or she thought that like she thought there was something wrong with the fact that they hadn't changed the room and I and I I took that again as the sense of guilt when she, from Ingrid Bergman character because she sees how much her daughter loved this child who is now gone and she still uh feels connected to the child even though the child is gone and i and i took that the reason she's like let's just go for a walk let's stop talking about this i really took that as she just cannot handle the fact that her daughter loved the child so much where where i think she knows that she didn't have that herself for her own kid kid children yeah. i don't know if that is is that why you thought she was getting distant or or then she went to the husband and said i think there's something wrong with her she's neurotic i don't know if, i was if that really was something confused you thought. by that and then i read an article that was saying that um i mean uh, obviously with ingmar bergman films mortality comes into play and you have the, the mortality here is the um, other daughter helena's like impending death because she's slowly dying of this disease but then also the death yeah. of this of the the young child and um, there's there's like there was two points. One was that the mother, like um, Ingrid Bergman's character Charlotte, um, the death of a child is a remembrance. Uh, is like a reminder of your own mortality, and that's something that kind of maybe like was thrown at her. Like, doesn't matter how old you are, mortality is like your yeah. your mortality is determined. Um, and then another point was that um, she uh, later on in the film 
when she's speaking in English, which totally threw me off. Oh yeah, it's her agent. Yeah. Like, Wait, <laughs> I was hearing Swedish this whole time. Yeah. But she says that she wishes that her young her younger daughter who's ill would just die. Yes. So yes. There there is like she's trying to distance herself from the pain of death. But also death is a way to just kind of end something and push it aside so that yes. it no longer affects her. That's so a good point. Yeah. It's kind of she's she's a very complicated character because she's obviously sort of mourning her lover. But um, the thought of just her daughter dying and just being done with is also appealing to her. It's just. Yeah. What well, what I like. So, person. Yeah. What I what I like so much about that scene is that she's talking so much to her agent, like her agent even falls asleep at a certain, it's her agent on the train yes. uh, at a certain she's point. She's like, wake up, yeah. I'm going to talk. <laughs> and I, I I, think because of what she had experienced with her daughter, it's like, she just couldn't sit with it. So her need to escape was just, I'm just going to keep talking. And then there's a moment where she just catches her reflection in the window and she seems almost oh, like put off yes. by her own, which was really interesting because she's this woman who, has has so much guilt because she because she was not at home a lot because she was this famous concert pianist i mean as soon as she sees her daughter helena she didn't know that helena was living with with um liv oldman you know and and she's she's like oh i wish you had told me and then she sees her and she tries to you know be very nice and warm and she can't understand her. I mean, it was like, I, again, there was a couple of, of laughs I had when, when, you know, the, the, the daughter Helena is trying to talk and, and the only one who seems to understand her is Liv Ullman. And she's kind of glancing at Liv Ullman every now and then, like, what is she saying? Um, and it's almost like Liv Ullman has taken over the, the mother role uh, because, you know, she hasn't been around, but she's, she immediately then goes into her bedroom and she, you know, she's talking to herself and she's saying, Oh, I, I always, I always feel, feel guilty. And what I thought was interesting about this film is that here's this woman who is a famous uh, pianist and, you know, you get the impression she was, she was the breadwinner as well. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a strong suggestion that her husband didn't have much money. I, you, you don't really know what he did. And, you know, she's made to feel guilty because she wasn't she wasn't as home as much. But and Liv Oldman said this, too, in, in the interview, it's like, but, you know, men do that all the time. <laughs> it's like that's like so that's like common for men to be the breadwinner. And if they have to go off and no one makes them feel like, hey, you're doing something you're doing something wrong. I remember my sister-in-law once said something to me interesting. It's like women can never win. It's like if they go to work, they feel guilty that they're working. And then if they're not working, they feel guilty that they're not contributing to the bills. <laughs> so it's like, so it's like, why is this woman made to feel so terrible? I mean, I know that there are emotional problems she had, but just in the sense that she had to work and she and that she wasn't home as much. It's like, it's like, how dare you? You're, you're a mother and you should be acting in a different way. She even says that how she, after a concert, I think uh, maybe it was the conductor or something who said, why don't you just go home and be like a respectable woman? And she's like, oh, did I play that badly? And so she's carried, like, it, it, it's interesting because she is self-centered, like she's complicated, but she is aware that she is doing, like that, that she is letting people down. Like, I didn't think she was a total narcissist like that mm. she was all about herself. Like, yes, she was self-serving and yes, she, she brought the conversations to herself and she talked to, she wasn't, you know, and things like that. But I, I was glad that Bergman didn't just make her a total villain, even though I didn't think it was fair that we didn't see enough of her point of view in the end. Like, I wish that there was something that perhaps she could have said to the daughter, like, you know, men aren't treated this way. Why are only you know, if, uh, why are only women uh, made to feel guilty because they were the ones who had to work or whatever? I don't know if that was something you, you, if that was your experience, like, did you think that maybe there should have been more of her point of view? You know, I, I just thought it was interesting because I got the impression that she was really, they were really trying to paint her as a villain. Yeah. Because yeah. especially when you get to the point when you learn more about, um, 
I have a son who died um, right before he turned four. He drowned and Charlotte wasn't there for his birth, for her That's pregnancy, right. his birth, any time in his life yeah. after the drowning, nothing. She wasn't there at all. So to me, she is selfish in many regards, but I think also she's trying very much to protect herself, kind of keep herself in a bubble. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So any kind of anything that that threatens to hurt her in some way or ask too much of her because she pours so much of her energy into her music and her right. career that right. everything else is a threat to take some of that away from her that she pushes back against it and one yeah. of them was yeah. accepting a grandchild into her life you know that would have been that would have taken some of her energy away so to me, she is very much portrayed as a villain, but you do pick up on things too, because we do get to learn some about her background. But yeah, she it, because she's so shielded, she doesn't, like you said, she doesn't really fight back. Yeah, she doesn't really right. explain things, and that could just be part of her, um, you know, protecting herself. But also, we kind of want to know more because we get quite a bit of background on Eva, with especially exactly. with those flashbacks to her childhood. Yeah, and I like what you said about um, Ingrid Bergman looking into her reflection in the train because then in the flashback scene, you have um, is it Lynn Ullman? Oh, uh, um, yes, the daughter, uh, Liv Ullman, and Ingmar Bergman's daughter, who plays the younger Eva. Um, yeah. she's she's looking into a full length mirror and she's thinking about, I want to say their criticisms of her eyes and her feet that her mom pointed out and she's kind of reflecting on herself. So there, I, I, I know that this is like a thing in Ingmar Bergman's films is like the mirrors and the reflections, but I yeah. thought that was interesting, but yeah. yeah, you're, you're right about that. We really don't get much on the mother's side and we should know a little more because otherwise <laughs> yeah. she can be, maybe two one note like there's some complexity there yeah definitely i mean he certainly empathizes with her because there's that moment where she's lying on the floor and she's and she says she does say you know well my i don't even remember what my parents look like um they i don't remember any tenderness i don't remember any love and the only thing that i really loved or i could really express myself was my music and so she put all her energy into her creative side and so it's this you know um uh, this this recycled behavior goes down it's like because maybe people didn't love her in the proper way that she couldn't then do that with her own children and she even says i she was honest in saying i didn't know how to be your mother i felt that you wanted too much for me <laughs> which which again was kind of funny because you know Liv Ullman's like well what like, i'm just a kid right like what do you mean wanted too much from you uh you want what every child wants uh but for her you know she says you know she felt as helpless about being a mother as maybe the daughter felt about her which again is so so raw and so deep and those are things that that that's a hard thing to 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 admit and i i just was really i was really fascinated i was really fascinated by that this like this people who this woman who just doesn't know how to be a parent but where whereas i can under i can see how the the story was veering the audience more towards on the side of Liv Ullman and against Ingrid Bergman, I did think there was enough to sort of also question the father because in the flashbacks with the father, yes, he was compassionate when the daughter's crying because the mother has to go out of town for a concert. But if you look at the father, they're sitting at a dining table and it's like this long table with this distance between them. And then his brother comes over and you see the daughter just watching them from a distance and she's not really included. And so I was thinking he like, there's just enough in there where he's saying there may be problems with the father as well. You know, we just, we don't get into it. Right. I don't know if, the, yeah. if what you, if that was something in the flashbacks you thought of. That um that scene um when she's in the doorway and the father and uncle are talking reminded me of yes. a scene in Giant, um the film with Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson and they're newly married and Rock Hudson is with a bunch of men in a room and they're talking and she wants to join in but it's very clear that 
you're a woman, you can't be part of this. So um, that reminded exactly. me of that a bit. Like there's yeah. some sh- shielding around like a patriarchal structure where the dad is loving to the daughter, but he's not a mother and he's yeah. not fulfilling right. the mother role in the way to to fill the void that's being left by the mother. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it, he he definitely, like you see some tenderness, um, but it's not it's not enough because she obviously really needs some parent to really give her the love that she's lacking. Yes, um, exactly. And I'm just thinking of that scene in the flashback where um, she's, the, the daughter's waiting outside with a coffee to give to her mother after she's finished her practice session. So she opens up the doors and brings her coffee and Eva sits down on the floor and just wants to interact with her mom and her mom just wants to decompress. She like pulls out a newspaper and she's like, why don't you go play outside? And that was so heartbreaking, but I could understand both sides. Like the child wants some attention from the mother and she's starved for attention, you know, and this is like one moment that she could capture, but as like, if you're a performer in any respect, or you have this passion that you put a lot of your energy into, you're exhausted after. Yeah. Oh and yeah. And sometimes yeah. you need alone time to like come down off of it. Yeah. Um. So that was like one of the few times I sympathized with the mother, and also with the daughter at the same time, because exactly. It's like, yeah. There, there's like a miscommunication. Um, yeah. But oh gosh, that was. But you're right. You're right. The 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 father isn't as strong as a figure, and I have to say, the husband Victor, um, he's really interesting because he breaks the fourth wall at the beginning. He kind of it's almost like a play where, and I I'm, I mean I I know that Ing- Ingmar Bergman was very much into his theatrical work at this point in his life. Yeah, you could see so, the influence on his movies for sure. Yes. And this one's very dialogue driven. Yeah. It's limited to just a few rooms. Um, so it's definitely theatrical. But you have Victor kind of um introducing his wife at the beginning, breaking the fourth wall. But he's and he's a pastor, so there's that the religious element of it. But he's got like he's not a player at all. He's a mediator. Like he he goes in between the, the the Charlotte and Eva and he like, you know, um, facilitates some things between them. Like at the end, he's going to deliver the letter. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he reads the letter, but he's very much like has no influence on anybody in this, which I think is really interesting. And I wonder if that's Ingmar Bergman's kind of criticism of maybe a father figure being you know, not very helpful in this case, because like he does, he like, there's, there's a point where he sees them having that big fight at night and he knows, okay, I'm not going to get involved. You know, let <laughs> yeah. Them he's hash like, I'll just out. hang out here. <laughs> or he starts to defend his wife when yeah. she, when the mother's like, wow, she's very neurotic. Um, right. but otherwise he's just, it's almost like he's a, he's like a part-time narrator Yeah, or, um he's he's an in-between but he's not like a character I don't know yeah yeah no I agree he's not he's not too too involved but what I what I another element of his character which I found interesting was that he is her second husband and so she had been you know there's also during while they're fighting this uh, uh this the story of this abortion suddenly comes up where she's yeah. like oh also you forced me to have in yeah. bergman films <laughs> oh yeah yeah she's like you forced me to you know or i don't, I don't i'm not i shouldn't that's not the ex- i shouldn't say that that's the exact line but she basically says you know strongly suggests that their mother kind of talked her into into yes. her an abortion when she was 18 because of her age and she's like well my you know my husband was a lot older uh so this you know so the this man who she's with now who's a pastor and he's he's the second husband and as he says at the beginning is that oh you know my wife told me she's not capable uh, of loving but then i think to myself is that really true and it's it's another it's another element of something she's blaming her mother for where she's like well you didn't love me and now i don't know how to love but again you know well she perhaps she was crazy in love with the first husband 
we don't really know how that ended. Did it have something yeah, it's not to do much information to go? You know, off it, of, yeah, yeah, it's ambiguous, and it's like did that, did that did that have something to do with the um with the the abortion? And I'm like, I don't, I I I think she's just she was just telling herself she didn't she couldn't love. I think she just didn't love this guy. <laughs> I yeah, think she just, I got that too. That it's you know, not that she's incapable of love, like you had mentioned earlier. She had a lot of love for her son and a lot of love for her for the sister, sister yeah. who she, yeah. she she's treating like she's the mother because there's no mother figure to take care of her. So she is yeah. very loving, but yeah, she just doesn't love this guy. That's and what I thought. And there's also a suggestion that because her and her husband Victor tried for many years to have a child. That's and right. finally had their son that there's some suggestion that because she had an abortion early on that that almost completely ruined her chances of yeah that's true child later on and also yeah. something to punish yeah. her mother about but i mean with ingmar bergman he was very fascinated with abortion with unwanted children mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. having a child and not wanting the child um yeah. Yeah. And also with just like the end of life too, like ending a life or being at the end of life. So that it's like a very strong, um, the very strong themes in his movies. And then when the abortion thing came up in the story, I'm like, whoa, that's a Bergman. That's a Bergman theme. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's very, it's a very small part of the story, but it stands out. You're like, wait, what, what happened? Exactly. I mean, he, 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 I thought that was very, that was very clever part of the screenplay because he, he kept it open ended enough so that, mm. I, that you do question the daughter, the, all this blaming of everything and the mother. And Liv Ullman even said, you know, like that she didn't care for this character because she blames everything on the mother and that you, she, you, there has to come to a, a point where you have to take responsibility for your own life. Like, yes, yes. your parents are going to do things that are wrong and things that are right and things that affect you in bad, or maybe really bad ways and really good ways. But, you know, you can't just say, you know, everything that's happened to me is my mother's fault because it's, again, it's, it's open-ended enough that, you do think is that really true like are do you really not love your your husband now because you just can't love like i i i thought that was really i thought that was really well done that he left those those uh problems that come up from the past um unresolved i i just thought that that was really interesting and then and then this whole other element i was curious what you thought about this i wasn't really sure how necessary it was that leonardo who's this you know boyfriend of ingrid bergman for many years uh ingrid bergman's character for many years and she's basically saying that helena fell in love with this guy and that they kissed and i was like what, that was went that, over that... my head. I was like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah. And was this like, yeah. did she get ill afterwards? Well, I that mean, was so like... strange that, you know, because that was another thing that was interesting was that she was blaming the mother for the fact that this, that Helena got so sick. And again, that was another thing where I was like, come on. And that, that was actually, I that agree. was actually one of the times when Charlotte Ingrid Bergman's character defends herself a little bit. Um, but, you know, then I'm thinking, well, is this whole story flashback even true? Like this whole thing of like, oh, yeah, Leonardo loved was in love with your daughter, basically, and kissed it, kissed her. I'm like, OK, I just thought that was so odd. Like, it, again, was it was very strange. There was just enough to question uh, Eva to think, are you just trying to destroy your mother from your anger? Like, again, her her anger is justifiable, but. It's just, it's a little too much. And then at the same time, he has Helena uh, jumping out of her bed and crying out for the mother who's not coming, very much like a like a baby, like, you know, helpless mama woman come, upstairs. Mama yeah. That was, yeah, it was yeah. And, heartbreaking. you know, again, he's, he's, I, I do think that it, it was, it was pushing you to side with Eva because he, <laughs> He's he has this whole monologue, and then at the same time, he has this other woman calling out for the mother, and no one can hear her. Um, I think I think Liv Ullman was right about that. I think Bergman was trying to get the audience to go that way, even though he was clever enough to not just make it cut and dry. But mm -hmm. 
you know that that's what I thought. I mean, if, judging what you were saying, I think that's you 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 felt the same way. Yeah, and I think it's also interesting. Uh, Liv Ullman had uh, said in an interview that she. I don't know if it was she that came up with the idea or um, if someone else came up with the idea of almost l- appearing like a child. She's a 40 year old woman. Yes, that was, you great. know, yeah. but, and she's, you know, a journalist and she was a mom and, and she's taking care of her sister. So she's an adult, but she's got these braids around yeah. her head. Um, and she so looks perfect. like a child. She's got no makeup. Yeah. She's very, um, She's got this childlike demeanor and it's almost like she's stuck in this childhood where yeah. she couldn't advance into adulthood. And when yeah. she tried to advance in the adulthood and have this relationship and then she had to have the abortion and then that kind of stunted her growth that she's stuck in this time and vis- that's a visual cue of it. So in that way, you think of um, her being maybe more of an unreliable character in terms of her leading with her emotions because she hasn't exactly aged emotionally enough to really be able to parcel that's everything. A good point. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I thought that was a great choice in, in terms of uh, her wardrobe and her look to make her mm-hmm. look like, like she's still a child. And even the way she, when I thought it was so beautifully performed as Ingrid Bergman like gets to their place and just the way she like embraced her, like it, it was very innocent and kid like she's like, Mom, mom, mom. It's like yes. it was very innocent. And then you know, before you know it, she's like she's saying to her husband, Oh, why did she even come? And it's that it's that it's like the little kid who was so excited to see the mother, and then when the mother's there, she's just quiet in the corner. It's like this she feels let down. Like, what am I so excited about? She's just going to leave again, you know, or something along those lines. But I thought that was really good. You reminded me of a scene um, when they're having the big nighttime confrontation and they're both drinking wine out of these little glasses and Liv Ullman drinks some wine and she gets some on her, on her mouth. And I, I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but that reminded me of like maybe someone who's drinking alcohol for the first time and, you know, yeah, like not realizing yeah. that wine might stain a little bit. Um, and she's trying to meet her mother at an adult level in terms of they're both sharing an adult beverage. Although in Europe, it's a lot more lax, you know, when at what age right. you can drink alcohol. But still, I think that that was an interesting way to showcase her as still childlike. She's trying to meet her mom as almost like a peer um, as adults, but really she's still in child mode emotionally. Yeah. yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's so, it's, it's just beautifully done and it, inv- and it it's so emotional and, and it, and then it involves the audience to a strong degree as well. I don't know yeah. if you, I only watched a little bit of it. I want to see it, but like on the Criterion channel, there's like a three and a half hour documentary on the making of it. I don't know. Did you see any of it? It's pretty long. I didn't end up having time. I, I watched yeah. the beginning of it. Right, um, right. But I'm like, wow. I mean, I watched, they were at the table read and they were yeah. just kind of hashing out things, but that's as far as I got. I mean, I, I know at this time in his career, he was documenting a lot of his work. So he had done this, I think, for a few other films yes, he did, as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, yeah. Like, that's like more than twice the length of the actual <laughs> movie is the making of. I, yeah. I, yeah. I told my husband, is that really a three there? Am I like not seeing? Yeah. <laughs> three hours. Yeah. But it's... no, I didn't get to see the whole thing. Yeah, no, I I didn't either. I I think I I think I will get to it, but um, I didn't I didn't watch the whole way through. But but uh, the Liv Ullman interview, uh, which you you watched, they they cut to it sometimes, and and I thought they showed some some really great moments, which were also comical because you know here Ingrid Bergman, who's largely worked in Hollywood or in Italy with her ex husband, um, Rossellini, and here she is now working with Bergman for the first time, Ingmar Bergman. And as Liv Ullman said, people didn't ever question him about the the actual text. It was always like they just worked in a very visceral, organic way. And so there wasn't like, hey, can we change this? And then you see Ingrid Bergman like, I think this speech is too long. <laughs> and you just see Ingmar Bergman's just like, he's nodding and looking at her. But 
I just thought it was interesting that it, it, like, Liv Ullman said like that actually really hurt his feelings that like someone would be like criticizing his his writing. I guess he his... took the auteur to an extreme. <laughs> like this is yeah. his. You don't touch it. You just act it. And exactly. I remember he he said something about how she he thought she was stuck in the forties because she had come to the project having rehearsed it in front of a mirror yes and yeah. she was overacting and he wanted a more natural performance which i really think he got out of her. oh yeah like her yeah. performance felt like very um it, it leaned more towards realism and then she it could use so that real. beautiful expressive face of hers oh god um, yeah. for the subtle subtle moments but um I thought that was interesting how they kind of butted heads and I don't disagree with her in two respects that there should have been a couple lighter moments. There should have been a little more like maybe a couple of good things about the mom. I think so too. I think so too. Yeah. Because no one's truly like, unless you're like a serial killer, I don't know if like, it's like, I mean, no one's truly that bad. There's some good elements usually of of majority of people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I thought I thought that was interesting that like she she wanted to add some things to it and he was like, nope, nope. Yeah, no, I th- I thought she had I thought she totally had valid points and I think I think she was right. I think that would have made uh, I think people would have maybe been caught in between of who to side with or seen more of uh, both of their points. Yeah. Uh, again, like from everything we're describing, there there is enough to question Liv Ullman. But I think only if you go back and watch it again, because it's so strong. Um, yeah. The nighttime so confrontation strong. scene is so long. Yeah, it but really I do is. agree with her that it could have been cut down some, and it's leans more on Liv Ullman because she's got the flashbacks and she's really doing yeah. like the cry screaming, you yeah. know. Um, and like Ingrid Bergman's character is just kind of taking it in, and like they do have some great lines that they exchange with each other about like, oh my god, am I that awful? Like, yes, and, and, yeah. and the uh, um, Liv Ullman's like, um, is is my misfortune your triumph? Like, there's some like really heady things there, but it's oh, yeah. emotionally exhausting. I got oh, yeah. really, yeah. T- I had to, I was like turning down the volume on my TV at one point because yeah, it's, it's so intense. intense. It's, it's so really intense. It went too long. Yeah, it went a little too long, but still powerful, but too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would have, I would have had more from from the Ingrid Bergman character. I I was surprised to hear that she came in so pre-planned in what she was going to do that that Bergman had to um, get her to work organically because, you know, she's she's always been, at least my my experience or my opinion of her performances is that she's always been really realistic. Like she was never hammy. She was like, she never seemed like she pre-planned anything. So I was surprised that maybe, maybe it was from anxiety because I know as an actor myself, sometimes actors do fall into the trap of like pre-planning because they're so anxious and they mm-hmm. and and you think oh shit wait now i've now i've mapped out exactly what i'm going to do um which never works <laughs> and and i i was surprised to hear that but at the same time like she also was like dying on this which i didn't know i didn't know she was that sick at this yeah. point this is her last film and then she died this came out in 78 so let's say they shot it in 77 and she died 5 years later so i didn't realize she was already sick at this point which must have been really hard to have done this intense a role while you're you know have a cancer that is not cure like i don't know exactly the details if they just couldn't she had i think she had been sick then recovered and then on the set of this she found like a another lump and then she got treatment and then it kind of Oh wow! Kind of disintegrated okay. after that. So yeah, and she's in. This is an interesting time in her career too because um, she had that exile, um, like Ingmar Bergman, who had his own self, you know, exile because of you know his country and like the taxes. taxes. Yeah. She had an exile because she herself also left a like she she yeah. you know left a family essentially. Yeah. 
and um, moved to Italy to be with Roberto Rossellini. And that at the time in the 50s was very scandalous. So she was kind of persona non grata in Hollywood. But then around this time when she makes Autumn Sonata, she had already come back to Hollywood and made a few films like Anastasia and Indiscreet. That was kind of like her homecoming back to American movies. But I think she's doing more... Um, theater at this point so maybe that's where the being very prepared comes into maybe her more um because he he made these essentially their lower budget art films yes that yeah. they're not meant to be big big uh, box office hits they're not meant to have mass appeal but that's kind of outside of her scope, unless you're ta- unless you're looking at his her Italian movies, right? Um, and now she's coming back to like theater and American film. That maybe she kind of lost touch with that. I don't know. Yeah, I'm it's it's like- yeah no no it's 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 hard to say. I mean, because even like a like a really good theater actor will will even though you you obviously rehearse a lot more you will you will always uh I, again a good a good one will i think will approach it uh in the sense to just leave it leave yourself open and you know still not pre-plan it uh, i mean the reason of course that they rehearse so much in theater is because they have to do like this whole show in one night and so they you know rehearsing bits at a time whereas as you know film is just we'll do it like 10 times straight and we got it right whereas like a play i can do it one scene amazing today but we may not rehearse the scene for another week because we have to mm-hmm. do this whole show so it it could be because you know theater there is that temptation to pre-plan things because you're gonna do it this one night and you're like oh i'm not there's no take two right but who knows she may may be on stage she wasn't as truthful or as real because I think on yeah you you might be right I mean who knows because like I said on film she was always really truthful like really realistic uh never hammy it's subtle you know she was always yeah. like in wa- watching her Casablanca there's nothing like intense about her yeah in terms of like her mannerisms but you can tell there's an intensity of emotion inside it like beams out of her absolutely so i always yeah. thought she was one of those actresses that excelled at subtlety whereas yeah. some others did not so yeah, yeah i was exactly. also surprised so yeah. and also it could have been the pressure of working with him for the first time because he'd already yeah. made like 50 movies or something like yeah. that this was this one point. of his last as well <laughs> Like yeah. he did a lot of television movies after this, but then after right. um, he only did, I think one or two more features after this, this was one of his, his last as well. But I, um, four years ago, Liv Ullman was here in Toronto because they oh, did nice. uh, a, re- a retrospective of Bergman's films at the TIFF uh, Bell Lightbox, which I know, you know, cause you've been here uh, a number of times. I love that place. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. So I went to watch the interview. It's actually still on YouTube. It was really, oh. it's, it, I think Tiff put it on YouTube. It was a really good interview. And then when this, when this movie came up, the man who was interviewing her said, oh, well, that must have really resonated with Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman, because uh, she also, I, 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 I don't want to quote him directly, but he basically said, well, she left her family uh, just like this character is doing and and Liv Ullman got really mad she was like no she <laughs> not quite leave the her same fa-. yeah yeah <laughs> and I think even in that interview she was defensive about that she she says something about it like um that you know be, that yes this may have hit a hit a nerve for in- Ingrid Bergman's real life because you know yeah she she had a second husband and she had she started a whole new family and and uh you know she had a big career when her children were you know like teenagers and she had to leave at times and things like that um but she does sort of defend her in in in, to say like no but she was a really good mother really loving attentive mother but if uh if i can I'll, i'll I'll find the link and I'll send it to you and I'll, I'll put it in the description box as well, because it's really interesting to see Liv Ullman. Like it was really awkward all too. Like she suddenly just, it was this pleasant talk I and she suddenly that. got so mad at the interviewer. And then he just stopped and just was anyways, <laughs> he was next question. 
but it made um, for a memorable moment. And yeah, no, it was like, great. Yeah, to, it's to not the same thing because, yeah. you know, it's like the, the, and also we would not cast that same, or well, we would cast some judgment. We would not cast the same level of judgment with a guy who left his family exactly. and went exactly. somewhere else. So, yeah, I think that's yeah. also what his Ingrid, uh, sorry, Liv Oldman off a little bit to say, like, here we go again, you know. Um, so yeah, no, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. Um, did you ever see that the documentary on Ingrid Berkman? I think that the, the Criterion did, I think it's called yes. In Ingrid in her own words. I think that's yes, what it's called. I watched that a couple of years ago. Really yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, that was real. That was really good. And you know, yes. she, she had been, she had become a mother really, really young. Like I, I don't think she was, I think she was pretty early in her career. So he, he yeah. you know, these, she had this big life, right? And then, you know, life just gets messy with career and kids and falling in love with someone else. But I mean, this film, certainly there are similarities for sure, but we can't just say, oh, this is exactly what happened to- Yeah, it's not <laughs> like she was the inspiration. I mean, a lot of no, this no, was no. taken from Igmar Bergman's own oh, yeah. feelings yeah. about- him growing up with very emotionally distant parents. So there's more parallels to his life than there are to hers. But yeah, I'm sure yeah. she probably felt a bit of guilt because it kind of was like, wait, I'm playing this role and yeah. this happened in my life. But I love that Liv Ullman like stepped up to defend her. Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. I mean, great. I mean, Ber Ingmar Bergman himself, I mean, he had like seven or eight kids with you know, a number of different women. He also, yes. uh, you know, Liv Ullman is not, is not shy to say that he was not a good dad. Like she said it, even she says it in the interview here. And she said it, even when I saw her at the light box, she said he was not good. He did not know how to be a parent. So he's and putting that's himself in this too, too, you know, that you pass that along. And I think that that's covered a little bit in, in this movie too. I mean, like Ingrid Bergman's, like her character Charlotte, her parents weren't very loving to her. Then she's not very loving to her exactly. child. Exactly. And then her yeah. child is loving, but is thinking she's incapable of love. So like that kind of toxicity, like exactly. carries on. Yeah. yeah. It recycles down. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why Bergman was, you know, and, and Bergman, of course, was this, he was this artist and he needed to tell stories and make films and do plays just very much like Charlotte. Like she just, you know, yeah, you know, she was this woman who her main love was her art. And that really always came first. And, and Bergman, I mean, I shouldn't say I know for sure, but just because I didn't know the man, but from what I've read and seen, you know, that, that very much res he could identify with that as well. Right. So it's yeah. pretty, it's pretty he fascinating. He might have been having an existential crisis and funneled that into a movie. It, it could seems, be. It I'm, seems to yeah. be so much that's personal, even oh, though yeah, the exact yeah. things didn't happen. It There's so many parallels. It's very, it's always very, per I think his stories are always very personal. And he, you know, you had mentioned that there are recurring themes in his movies. And and another recurring theme is the, these people who, who were, were bad parents or who did not know how to be good parents. You see that in even in uh, Persona with Liv Ullman, mm -hmm. that was also, who's this woman who had this uh, child and hated being a parent and then sort of went like, you know, insane over it and hospitalized. Uh, and Wild Strawberries too. I mean, the, the old man looking back at his life, he was the same way with, you know, that his son like hated him, you know, and talked about how he destroyed him and <laughs> i only laugh because it's just it's just funny how he tapped not funny that it's literally funny but it's darkly funny that he tapped he's always able to tap into these you know darker sides of people um that i think is hard to admit i think it would be hard for anyone to admit that they failed as a parent or they didn't really want to have a child or um and things like that but it, it makes for great storytelling and you know even though this film has its share of flaws it certainly is um it's certainly wonderfully done i just want to also mention the dop is that he used many times uh sven nickfist is uh i hope i believe i'm saying that right he was uh you know just those close-ups are just absolutely unforgettable i mean god i could just I could just stare at them all day. You know, you just want to reach out and like touch the people like they're just so beautifully lit. I really enjoyed having you back and 
talking about uh, about this film and filmmaker that I've always really admired. So so thanks so much for your for your time and for for coming on. Where's the best place for people to follow you online? Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Raquel Stetcher, which is my name. Um, I post all of my writing work on there. I also have um, a blog out of the past blog.com where I write about classic movies and then kelmovies.com. Um, I write about new movies and I also write, um, like you had mentioned before, for Turner Classic Movies and DVD Netflix. So if you go to those websites, you'll find my work too. Great. Perfect. And I'll leave all those links in the description uh, box below if you want to check out uh, Raquel's uh, Twitter page, Instagram, and all of her writings. And you have a YouTube, cha- YouTube channel yes, as well, right? I have yeah, a YouTube okay. channel too. Great. Great. I'll leave all that below for people to check out. Well, Raquel, thanks again for your time and come again. Let's do it again sometime soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and or listening. If you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my YouTube channel and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I have ever recorded can be found. Go to youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I also want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon and receive bonus content, Head over to the link, patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. I also want to mention that if you're interested in leaving a donation to my YouTube channel, you can directly do so by clicking the thanks link, which you will find right below this video box here, right beside the like, comment, dislike links. Click the link that says thanks. And from there, you can leave a donation directly to my YouTube channel if you wish. And lastly, if this is your first time here on my YouTube channel and you want to subscribe to my channel, if you haven't already done so, please consider doing so by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left in just a second. Just click on that. And then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next episode.